Taking a step back, one way of seeing uh, these issues is to interpret them in the, uh, in the context of transfer. Transfer being the influence of previous experience with problems on some current problem that you're trying to resolve. And there are two main dimensions to transfer. One is its valence, so whether it's positive or negative. A positive transfer would be uh, when your experience with certain problems uh, allows for you know, faster and more efficient solving of the problem. Uh, in this case, uh, the mental set, when you're applying a mental set from a previous problem to a new problem, and the new problem requires the same type of mental set, then that is an example of positive transfer. Conversely, uh, you get negative transfer when your experience with prior problems uh, is actually hampering your ability to resolve uh, you know, efficiently and quickly uh, some new problem. And here, uh, you know, the example of the mental set, but from a different problem, so a mental set that doesn't help you solve the next problem, um, and, and, and in a sense, functional fixedness uh, also is an example of negative transfer, uh, although it's more broadly in the knowledge that you have and how you interpret or how you see the function of cer certain uh, objects. And the second dimension is that of uh, distance, near versus far. With near transfer being the effect of a previous problem on a new problem that is similar in context to the first problem you solved. And far transfer is when you have two problems that, that, that are in very different contexts, but somehow what you've learned from one is now being applied to uh, the second uh, problem. And there are many aspects or many variables that influence transfer, how similar two different problems are, um, uh, affects transfer. And you should keep in mind that there are two ways in which problems can be similar. You can have problems that are superficially similar, which means the, 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 the surface, the elements of it are similar. For example, the problems that have, that were all about the matches with Roman numerals were superficially very similar to each other. They all entailed uh, matches that could be moved and that represented no Roman numerals or operators. Um, however, you can also have tasks that are similar because of structural features, which means the structure of the problem itself, regardless of you know, the superficial features, well, that is similar. And so, for example, um, when, you, when we solve the problems you know, of type 1 in the matches, um, they all had the same, they, they were similar uh, with respect to their superficial features. Again, they were made of numerals and operators and matches that had to be moved. Um, and when it was the same type of problems, they were also similar in their structural features, meaning the way in which you had to manipulate um, the, the equation was similar. Now, conversely, you can have tasks that are superficially similar, for example, to tasks that also have, are, are both made of Roman numerals and matches and, and operators, but the structure of the problem, what you have to do is actually very different. This would be a case where you have a, uh, the tasks are similar superficially, but are dissimilarly structurally. And I will give you an example, just uh, a few slides down, of cases where problems can be superficially very different, but their underlying structure, what the problem is about, what are the variables and how you have to solve it, are somehow similar. Now, when you get similarity, this might help. Um, apply transfer. So this might help prior knowledge being applied or seeing how you know, a prior solution can be applied to a new problem. And here, um, uh, reasoning by analogy is something that we often do, and I'll give you an example a little bit later. And now context similarity is also, um, is also another variable, and this is really the idea of whether there are, you know, the, the context of the problem uh, either in a physical, so with respect to physical dimensions or with respect to social context might be similar. And finally, time interval, which is just how long has it been since you solved the prior problem that might be relevant to the new problem. And of course, the more time has passed in between the two, um, the, um, the, um, uh, the less likely transfer is to happen. Here's a classic example of transfer. This was published by Chen and colleagues in 2004. But here's what they did. They gave the following problem 
who were both American students and Chinese students. And I explain why that is, why they did this, um, this um, cross-cultural study in just a moment. Uh, but they took advantage of cross-cultural differences in order to make the point of transfer. So here's a problem. The chief of a jungle region uh, takes his boat to a nearby riverside village to collect taxes. Our current tax law requires the villagers to pay an amount of gold equal in weight to a big elephant statue. Now, unfortunately, the chief on that day forgot his scale, so he cannot tell how, um, how heavy the statue is, uh, but does have the statue on him. And so there they are, standing by the river, and statue in hand, um, and now they have to find a way to take from the villagers the same amount, the amount of money that would equal the weight of the statue. Can you find a way to measure the right amount of gold? What is interesting about this study is that American students typically only have, uh, as a group, just about an 8% solving rate of the problem. On the other hand, Chinese students uh, have 69% solving rate for this problem. And see, this is exactly why uh, Chen and colleagues selected this particular story that I just told you. And the reason is that in Chinese folklore, there is a story about um, Cao Chong, uh, a young prince, who was faced with having to find a way to weigh an elephant. And the story goes that his father, um, the local ruler, um, had received as a gift uh, an elephant and wanted to know its weight. You know, all the people in his court um, was trying to figure out a way how to weigh this elephant, uh, but of course there was no scale large enough so that the elephant could be weighed. Uh, and that's when uh, Tao Chong uh, had the idea to take the elephant, bring him to um, inside a boat uh, on the river, and then once the elephant had stepped in, he made a mark on the boat um, to mark by just how much had the boat sank once the elephant was on it. Then he made the elephant step out to um, ask people to put uh, stones inside the boat until it would sort of dip again uh, down to the same line. And at that point, one could just take the stones and weigh those and add them all up, minus, I guess, his weight since he was in the boat too. Um, and, and, and this way, he figured out a way uh, to measure the weight of the elephant. And see, so the idea, and this is why this is relevant to transfer, this is a fairly well-known uh, story in Chinese folklore. So Chinese students uh, had this story in their, in their repertoire, in their knowledge, that they could pull from and, and, and essentially apply transfer in order to solve the, um, the new problem that, um, that I read a moment ago. On the other hand, this story is not part of American folklore. I don't quite think there's a, uh, there's a corresponding story or a similar story that could be drawn upon uh, in order to um, sort of uh, essentially have transfer and be able to solve uh, the problem. And this is why there's this big cross-cultural difference across American and Chinese students. So a wonderful example of how transfer operates. As I mentioned earlier, another important aspect of how our own experience and knowledge can help us solve problems is the idea of solving by analogy. And, uh, and Jake in our own uh, Keith Holyoke uh, addressed this in a now classic uh, paper in 1980. Now here's what they did. They gave participants the following problem. You're a doctor and you're faced with a patient who has a malignant tumor. Now this tumor is impossible to operate but unless the tumor is destroyed, the patient will not survive. Now, there happens to be a new technology, a, a kind of ray that can be used to destroy the tumor. Now, if, if the rays, um, so if these are multiple rays that can be used, if they, if they reach the tumor all at once, all together, and at a sufficiently high intensity, then the tumor will be destroyed. However, at this intensity, uh, the healthy tissue will also uh, the healthy tissue that the, the, the rays pass through will also be destroyed, will also be affected. Uh, if you make the rays any less intense, um, then it will not affect the healthy tissue, but it will also not destroy the tumor. 
how can you solve this problem? Uh, what kind of procedure right, can you use in order to destroy the tumor but not affect any of the healthy tissue? And when you ask the problem this way, the typical solvering rate is just about 10%. And if you don't want to know the solution right away, pause the video. Now, one way to solve, uh, in fact, well, well, the classic way to solve the problem is to actually take the different rays and scatter them so that, right, you have multiple rays and they're all focused on wherever the tumor is. But the important point is that the rays only converge at the place of the tumor. So this way, each individual ray is not strong enough to harm healthy tissue. And they all converge and give maximum power where the tumor is. Now, as I said, this solution uh, is fairly infrequent, uh, just about 10% of the times, um, uh, at least at the time this experiment uh, was done. But here's the manipulation. Some participants um, were also given other stories to read. Now, some were completely irrelevant, but one of these stories had to do with uh, a general who was trying to attack a fortress. And as, as part um, of the story, the fortress could only be reached through a number of bridges, but each bridge was quite small and couldn't carry the full army. And so eventually the general in the story had to separate um, the army in smaller, in smaller units and each one would attack along one of these bridges. And so, and you might already see how by analogy, the two problems are fairly similar. In both cases, you have sort of, um, uh, there's something that you're trying to deploy, but you can't deploy it all at once. In the case of the rays, because they're harmful. In the case of the, um, of the general attacking the fortress, because you can fit all of the army uh, on one bridge. And so you have to split the army uh, to all uh, converge towards uh, the, um, the fortress, exactly the same idea as the solution for the, um, uh, for the ray problem. Now, after reading the, this general, the story of the general attacking the fortress, just about 40% of participants um, with no further help could come up with the solution that I mentioned for the ray problem, the radiation problem. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the remaining 40% um, um, of those who could not solve it initially um, could solve it after uh, they were told that the, 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 the problem, the, the general uh, attacking the fortress problem uh, actually is relevant to solving the radiation problem. So after they were given this additional cue, very similar, if you remember, to how um, in the two rope experiment, um, at first you would, um, at first the, the experimenter would just brush one of the ropes to, to make it swing. Uh, and then if that didn't help, um, the experiment would actually say, look, there, there's this hammer right here is relevant to your solution, right? Exactly the same setup. Uh, and so sort of after receiving this kind of hint, uh, participants could sort of by analogy could find the solution to the radiation problem. So this is a good demonstration of how we use uh, knowledge and experience information we already have in order to solve new problems.